great. Uh, we're a little ahead of time, but I'm going to just take a minute here and introduce our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Dan Daniel Clausen. Um, so he is from Vanderbilt University and, and directs their uh, Level 1 HDSA Center of Excellence there. Um, uh, we met uh, Dr. Clausen uh, several years ago, and he and I have talked a lot about Huntington's and a bunch of other neurological issues. Um, tried to bring him down to Florida, but uh, I guess he really likes Nashville. <laughs> um, but uh, Dr. Clausen um, has been working in Huntington's for many years, uh, really knowledgeable, um, and uh, specializes in neurogenic disorders, cognition, behavior, um, is well-funded um, through, through the NIH, um, and we're really pleased to actually have him talk and give us an update. I know that his center is actively involved in many of the latest um, hunting disease trials um, as a level one center. Um, so likely has some experience with the, some of the trials that have so far have not reached Florida yet. Um, and we can hear about some of those new trials that are coming to us as well as sort of what's been going on in Huntington. Um, I know we all have questions about this as to where you're going and we all looking for that next therapy. And of course, hopefully the eventual cure, which um, I think is actually closer than we think it is. So um, with that, I'm going to, uh, we're gonna just take a brief break. We're gonna get uh, Dr. Clausen set up, okay, with his slides. Um, before we head over to that, I'm gonna just say one um, last sort of thank you uh, that we need to give to our sponsors. Um, I'd like to thank the Huntington's Disease Society of America uh, for their generous support of our center. Um, they are supported by generous uh, gifts from um, Genentech and Unicure, who also are engaged in Huntington's disease research um, and in general supporting education. Um, and so uh, please give them a shout out and just remember these are uh, folks sponsoring us for, throughout the day. Well, welcome to my uh, office in my home. Um, I'm in currently doing th this thing called study section. It's like when about 30 scientists get together and review grants. And um, I got to tell you, this is a welcome respite from that experience. And I'm happy to talk about Huntington's disease and research. Um, before I get too into it, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm interested in Huntington's disease. Um, and that it may kind of give you some just color as to who I am and, and what I what I do with Huntington. So I, I moved to Vanderbilt about 10 years ago and I did my training in understanding movement disorders and understanding um, cognition. And um, I, I did, uh, Dr. McFarland and I crossed paths a little bit at the University of Virginia, uh, but I did my fellowship there and, and I was really exposed to a, a really good Huntington's disease clinic there. And so when I moved to Vanderbilt, I was um, asked by a patient's family, uh, by a um, physician whose son had Huntington's disease to start a Huntington's disease clinic. Uh, up till that time, patients had been seen kind of, um, you know, in the clinics, but it was never really integrated. And so um, I started uh, the clinic with, with the idea that, you know, maybe we'll get 50 people or so interested in Huntington's disease. But I gotta tell you, it's, it's been amazing to see um, the evolution of the cl clinic. We now have over 450 uh, patient families that we see that have been touched in some way, shape or form by Huntington's disease. Um, and, I, and I gotta say that our clinic staff has grown a lot. We now have four uh, neurologists uh, on staff who see Huntington's patients and genetic counselors and social workers. And just like, like, like you have at, at University of Florida, we try and provide help for, for patients, you know, um, from along the life cycle. And for me personally, I, I think Huntington's is um, one of the most um, satisfying diseases to take care of. I, I think Huntington's disease is something um, that shows us the resilience in humanity. We see the best of people uh, with caregivers, uh, loving uh, loved ones with Huntington's, with patients suffering um, as the disease progresses. And I think uh, it's an absolute privilege to look after patients and families that have this uh, disease. 
So research, as you can imagine, is, is really an important part of my, uh, in our work. And um, it's been kind of integral to our clinic. And if we, we just recently looked at this and over 80% of people that see us are involved in some way, shape or form in clinic, uh, clinical research. And I think that's really a testament to, to what we think is important in research. So um, with that, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna take you through kind of some contemporary studies, but really the big picture is I'm asking the question, you know, where is Huntington's disease treatment going? And these may be some of the ways we get there. Um, because when I talk about Huntington's disease, I really want it to be a chronic disease like diabetes. I want, I want you to be able to get medications that basically help you live with Huntington's disease um, rather than uh, die from Huntington's disease. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to create therapies that will turn HD into a chronic condition. Um, and so we're trying that through understanding disease uh, modifying treatments through um, symptomatic treatments. And that's kind of where we're looking. So um, I'm gonna take you through, this is my outline because every talk has an outline. And you can, we'll talk about some um, kind of where, we, where we're coming from, some symptomatic trials. That means if you have Huntington's and you've got symptoms, um, what are the trials for that? And then disease modifying, which a lot of people ask about. And, and then talk about some resources that you can apply because this isn't exhaustive. I think if I did every trial, I may take up all five hours of your, uh, of your symposium. So hopefully it gets you excited and gets you engaged. Um, so let's talk about the, the general research. So I think, you know, there's, there's different ways that we talk about uh, research from the standpoint of understanding Huntington's. So certainly one of the most important bodies of research that has contributed to where we are today are studies that enrolled um, participants who may have an expanded CAG repeat or not, and followed them over time. And with those studies, we were able to learn about how there might be changes in the striatum or the putamen that um, track with the, pro the pro progression of disease. We've learned about clinical aspects of the disease progression. Uh, we've learned about um, the heterogeneity of how the disease affects people. And we call these studies observational studies because there's not necessarily like a, a medication you take or a treatment you take. You basically are uh, basically saying, I'm, I'm willing to come in and I'm willing to, um, to let, to contribute to a larger body of work to understand how, to, how Huntington's disease um, progresses over time. So th those are what we call observational studies. And I'll talk, I'll give an example of one of those. So for instance, at our center, we do, uh, we're just starting to do observational studies of at-risk youth. So these are children of HD patients. And we wanna know what is it like to be a child of a family that has Huntington's disease? We don't necessarily care about whether the child has or doesn't have an expanded repeat. We just wanna know how they, how they do. And what we found already is that children under have a lot of stress. They have a lot of stress from, from having a, a family with Huntington's and the, the children that are able to cope with that stress, uh, they have better executive function. And so from that study, we've, we've developed a new method to help children cope with stress, not using any pharmacologic management, just, just um, non-pharmacologic approaches. And that's an example of how we wouldn't have understood that unless we'd done the observational studies and that those observational studies led to us wanting to, to intervene uh, in, in, in ways to help families. So, so that's, so that's the, those studies. The other studies we talk about are symptomatic treatment studies. And so that's when you would get in a study and you would get a pill or a injection or a infusion. And we would look at how those uh, treatments help your symptoms. So the, the best example of that would be something like um, tetrabenazine, which was a medication that was developed 
not for Huntington's was actually developed for treatment of um, psychiatric symptoms. And they realized that it changes how dopamine is released in the brain. And so they gave a certain population um, that medication. The other half got a placebo or a sugar pill and they looked to see if that medication helped patients. And that led to an approval of a medication uh, called tetrabenazine. Later, that study was done for a, a variant of tetrabenazine, do tetrabenazine, and even now we're doing a study looking at Ingrezzo. Um, and so those are really important treatments because if we don't do those studies, we don't know if the medications work or not. Uh, and I'm pretty sure Dr. McFarlane and his team are doing that Connect HD study. So if you have chorea or if you have um, movements that, and you're not getting any medications for it, you might be interested in, in participating in that study. And then we also finally look at disease progression, and these are hard studies to do. So these are studies where you say, if I give you a therapy, how is that going to affect your symptom accrual over time? And you can imagine that these studies are a little bit longer than we're customarily uh, used to doing. So how do, you how, do you, how do you define disease progression? Do you, do you look at chorea? Do you look at memory issues? Do you look at walking? It's really kind of complicated, but these are the studies that are going on now where we're trying to basically say, what can we do to change the course of Huntington's disease? And so we'll talk about those uh, studies as well. <clears throat> so, Here's an example of some observational studies um, that I talked about. And I just want to emphasize um, a couple things. One is that through the use of these observational studies, we've been uh, forced to realize that the brain, uh, taking an MRI of the brain, can be useful in tracking how the disease progresses. And in this uh, picture of the brain here, this is basically a side view uh, down the middle and in front, there are certain regions in the brain that change over time. The putamen, that little blue area here, is one of those regions. So if you, if you participate in a study that may look at disease progression, it's because of these observational studies that we will now oftentimes ask patients to get an MRI scan. I know sometimes getting MRIs isn't fun. I've had them myself and you can kind of feel a little claustrophobic, but, but generally um, most people do well with them and these are really helpful in understanding how the disease is progressing. This one here is called the total, total motor score. And it's a basically when you see Dr. McFarlane or one of his colleagues, he'll get you to put your hands out, he'll look at your eyes, he'll look at your walking, he'll look at your speech and stick, make you stick your tongue out and do some uh, sequences with your hand and out, out of it, he'll get a score that really quantitates how much motor symptoms do you have. And so we wouldn't have known how these studies, um, how this, this does, how these um, outcomes progress unless we didn't do that. And, the, and now these are used all over the world. So when we do multi-center studies where we're trying to get you know, thousands of patients, if you, if you participate in these Huntington studies, you're part, you're part of a larger um, group of people that, um, all, that is basically worldwide that's trying to contribute to answering this question. And I think that's kind of cool uh, when you think about, uh, you, you know, just being, uh, feeling like the world is a little bit smaller. So Enroll HD is really the largest uh, observational study we have now. It started in 2012. If you can believe this, there's over 20,000 people that have participated in this study. And just get your head around that. That's amazing if you think about all that information that helps um, the progress of research in Huntington's disease. And so the goals of this study are just to, to understand how, uh, how a person um, feels or how a person functions over time. And so you, when you come for your enroll visit once a year, you'll get uh, some cognitive games that you'll play. You'll do a motor assessment. You'll um, they'll draw some blood. And they'll maybe ask you about how you feel and how your mood is. But it's um, really useful as we kind of uh, develop uh, studies and assessments that can test how these symptoms change over time. Um, and this is basically a picture of where in the United States, 
uh, and roll is. And I think there's one little orange flag in Jacksonville, if I remember correctly. Uh, so this would be something that would, that would be useful for you to participate. Um, really, the key right now is to, the, the emphasis of Enroll is to get people involved in Enroll like really early. So if you go to your genetic counselor and you find out you have Huntington's disease, you know, and you don't have many symptoms, it's a great time to get enrolled. Um, you can, we even have family members who don't have HD involved. And then you, you don't even have to find out if you have HD to get enrolled in, in, uh, in the study. You can just have, be at risk, um, like your parent could have it. And you really don't care about whether or not you have it or not, but you want to participate in research. And this is really useful um, for, for the study as well. Um, so I'm going to pivot over to, um, to some of the, uh, the symptomatic studies. And really, um, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of tetrabenazine has now um, resulted in two FDA-approved medications for Korea. In 2008, tetrabenazine. In 2017, do tetrabenazine. And we also refer to that as Osteto. And um, I can tell you that I was involved in two tetrabenazine study. Um, and I can't tell you how excited I was when I got the email early on a Friday morning that re revealed that the study had met its endpoints, meaning that the use of the medication improved chorea, it imp improved patients' opinion of their Huntington's disease, it improved their quality of life. And so this was like a huge enthusiastic um, moment for me as a, as a scientist and as a doctor. Um, and I think, you know, oftentimes you don't find FDA approvals, you know, sometimes you, you might have been in a study that it didn't work or it didn't show a big effect and those are frustrating. But, um, but these, these uh, studies have changed the way we treat Huntington's disease. Um, they've made us more aware of Korea, they've made us more interested in uh, treating Korea early. And so currently, there's a study called Connect HD. And I'm pretty sure you can do this one in Jacksonville as well. And this is where you come in and you, um, if you have Korea and you don't have any medicines for it, you can get um, either um, a placebo or a medicine called uh, valbenazine, which is a once a day medicine. And you can get it um, and see if it helps your quality of life. And a lot of people like it because um, you get to see your doctors more often, you get to follow in the clinic. And it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of exciting to be a part of. So if that's, if that's something you're interested in, I'd recommend you reach out to the team at Florida. And there's a new one that just started called Proof. We'll talk about it in a second, but that one's another pill um, which can potentially improve uh, patient symptoms. So this is just a little bit more about the Connect HD study. Um, valbenazine is, is kind of uh, like tetrabenazine and do tetrabenazine, except it's a little different. It's once a day and there's only two doses. So you can either get... Um, uh, one or another dose. And it's already used for a, a disease called tardive dyskinesia. And um, this study is attempting to see if it can improve chorea. And so it has some advantages potentially to patients. Some of my patients say, man, I have a hard time remembering to take my medicines. If I can just take it once a day, I'd feel better. I think I'd remember it. So that's a potential advantage, but, um, but we're going we're gonna to test it. Uh, and this is a little cartoon about how the medicine works. It basically prevents dopamine from being released. And so with Korea, you have abnormal dopamine uh, release and um, postsynaptic response of that dopamine receptor. And so you're, you're modifying that through this uh, mechanism. Um, as I said, to get involved in this study, you have Korea. And if you don't know if you have Korea, you can ask your, um, your team down in Florida and they'll, they'll give you some advice on it. You can't be taking anything right now, like a VMAT2, and you can't be on antipsychotic medication. Sometimes we use these for Korea as well. Once so you come in, you get nine visits over 18 weeks. And then once you finish that, you're guaranteed to get the medication in what's called an open label extension. This means we're going to give you the pill. We're not going to let you know if it's the sugar or the real thing. It's going to be the real thing. And then you get it as long as the um, trial keeps going. And so we have a goal of 120 participants. Um, we're getting there, so we really want to finish doing this, and so if you're interested, we'd love for you to be a part of it. Proof is an interesting one. It's a, it's a medication that's also known as predopidine, and, I, and this has a long history in Huntington's disease. 
monkeys. It, it's had a number of different trials. Uh, the most recent one finished in 2016 called Pride HD. Um, and when, when scientists looked at that study, they said, gosh, you know, there's some evidence that using this medicine uh, improves a patient's activities of daily living and it might slow the progression. And so um, we're gonna test whether or not this drug improves your quality of life by using a scale called the total functional capacity. And this scale really assesses how you do uh, on things like finance, your hobbies, taking care of yourself, those kind of things. And it's really, it's, it's really this, this um, study is designed to make your life easy. It's an oral medication. A lot of the assessments can happen on the phone or by a teleconference. Um, and um, it is, it's, a really, um, it's, a, it's really designed to be easy for the patient, easy for the site to do the study. There's no injections, there's no uh, CSF markers. And um, basically it works through this thing called the Sigma-1 receptor, which thought, thought to have a neuroprotective property. So the goal for this is um, a lot of people, so 480 people um, in North America and Europe, it'll last 78 weeks. Remember what I said, when you're looking at disease progression studies, they last a lot longer. So if you can compare this length of weeks to the Korea one, it's much longer, right? And then once you finish that, you get an open label. So you get the medication um, and it's enrolling now. And um, if you're interested in that one, talk to your talk to your team at Florida and I'm sure they'll be excited to tell you all about it. So I'll, I'll switch now to disease modifying trials, which I think a lot of people ask about and I'll give you kind of my opinions about these and, and, and hopefully some uh, optimism about this as well. So as I said, the goals of this are really to slow the progression. Can we change the way the HD progresses to where the first symptoms are much later than they would typically be uh, you didn't get the medication. And ultimately, could you actually prevent a patient from getting the disease itself? That's a really big question. That's a harder one than the, than the delaying question, uh, but that is one of the goals. And so there's different trials that are currently going on, and I think there's gonna be more coming down the pipeline, meaning that there's gonna be more in the very near future about these. So generation, HD is one that you, this, this um, symposium is funded by Genentech Roche and this, they're running a study that's doing this. Then there's Precision HD, which is a, um, another study called by, by WAVE, we'll talk about that one. And then there's another one by Unicure and you're, and you're getting funding from Unicure as well, AMT 130. Uh, and I'm, I'm optimistic that Jacksonville will be a part of that as well, hopefully. So this is the key Point. And, and this is where a lot of patients um, and families ask me questions about. So this is my kind of real top line, uh, simple way to try and explain it. So, you know, in 1993, the Huntington's gene was discovered. It's now, last time I checked, 2021. It's been a long time. And so there's been a lot of years that have gone on to where we've discovered the gene, but we haven't really translated that genetic discovery to treatment. And they, now we're starting to do that. And so the idea with, with this is that you kind of have this, this DNA marker of Huntington's disease, this expanded CAG repeat. And then the way your DNA uh, works is that it gets converted to this thing called RNA. And then that RNA gets converted into a protein. And that's generally how we get things done in the body. You got to make proteins and they got to work in a cohesive manner in order to keep the cells alive and to keep things moving forward. So the question is, could you interrupt this process to either turn off the Huntington's gene or to alter the product of the Huntington's gene? So two key words that I want you to remember. We talk about the Huntington protein either as wild type. So if you don't have Huntington's disease, you'd make wild type Huntington or mutant Huntington. And that is when, you've, when you have an expanded repeat, you turn into the protein you make is called mutant Huntington. And so when we look at this, these data, one of the hypotheses is if you reduce mutant Huntington protein, you will change the way Huntington's disease progresses. And that's the hypothesis we're testing. If you can do that, will that be a clinically important, clinically meaningful change in the progression of the patient? 
And so there's different ways you can do it. And I'll take you through some of them that are currently being used. And some of them people are thinking of using to show you the kind of diversity of thought there is into these studies. So um, here's, the, here's where the diversity of thought, and this is a complicated figure, but it really shouldn't be complicated. Uh, I'll take you through it. So at the end of the day, I'm gonna turn your attention to this right side of the figure. Um, you'll have either mutant Huntington or wild type Huntington. And that Huntington, uh, mutant Huntington gets cleaved into this exon one Huntington protein. So you can block the mRNA to protein by introducing something that interferes with mRNA to translation. And that's called, we use antisense oligomers or ASOs. Um, the other way you could potentially do it is you could kind of cut out the long CAG repeat. And there are some experimental things that people talk to me about in the clinic. They ask me questions about this thing called CRISPR and people have, um, often have questions about that, but that's where that comes from. So, um, so when you're looking at a trial or when you're thinking about a trial, having this idea of DNA to RNA to protein, that's really the idea for, to understand where these trials are working. And so there, here are the different pe ways people have thought about it. So you could modify the disease um, from the DNA by either cutting it out, or there's some of these things called zinc finger proteins that might modify this. You could alter the transcription of, um, the translation of the mRNA by using an ASO or another small molecule. Um, you could further alterna alternate um, some of these toxic RNAs by using another mechanism. And, and so you can see there's a lot of different shots on target. There's a lot of different ways that you could do it. And I think what we've got to figure out together is what's the best way to do it? And can we do something maybe in concert or over time that would basically modify the way a person progresses with Huntington's disease? And so this would be a way that you could think about it. So when you have um, a lot of this mutant Huntington level here, you would get a therapy. In this case, it's an example of ASO. You would lower the mutant Huntington and then you would get a, a benefit. That means you get a symptomatic benefit and that's what we're testing with some of these studies. So now this, the, the drug that Genentech has is called uh, Tominserin, Tomin, sorry, I got this one. Um, Tom and Urson, which um, used to be called RG6042, and I could um, remember RG6042 better than the new name, but that's what it's called. And so I don't know if you remember this, but a couple of years ago, there was all these newspaper reports and all these um, um, interviews with scientists where uh, in they published this data that said they gave 40 different doses of this antisense ligamer, ligamer, and I'm gonna use the word ASO from now on, um, just so you know what I'm saying. And they showed that when they did this, um, they lowered mutant Huntington. And it was a generally well tolerated procedure. When we say spinal taps, every, you know, people usually go, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. Um, but you know, a lot of people get spinal taps and I have a joke with my patients that I say that I do painless spin spinal taps. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not exactly the world's most fun procedure, but it's, you know, it's, it's well tolerated. And if you look at kind of how people did on it, people did pretty well. You know, some people had a little bit of pain um, with the procedure, other had some headaches, but it was generally well tolerated and small numbers of patients had these symptoms. Um, and it was, it was pretty well, it was pretty safe. There was some, um, there's no evidence of like worse um, infection in um, uh, there's some evidence of slight higher infections in the patients that got the medication, but it was generally well tolerated. There's some mild headaches. Um, and so they published this data in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it was kind of very exciting to see that, gosh, now at, since 1993, we've got a medicine that might be able to reduce the mutant Huntington protein. And this is, this is what the, the, the paper showed. So if you got placebo, you really didn't have a big change in your mutant Huntington level. But with increasing doses of this ASO, the mutant Huntington level went down. And that's the idea. Can we lower the production of this mutant Huntington uh, protein? And then can we um, 
therefore change the disease course. So uh, the good news is that we've got more data now on this, where we've given the medication to these patients, uh, these participants for a longer time. And this was a paper that was uh, published uh, that showed that you could do this over a really long time and it, it maintains a reduction in, in, in mutant Huntington. And that's been, that's been really exciting. In fact, this kind of data, allow, initially you had to get this um, quite frequently uh, every, every month. And you can imagine how, how consuming that is for, for the patient and for the team to have to give this every month. But now we can do it um, a little bit longer. We can do uh, some four weeks or even 16 weeks potentially or eight weeks potentially. Um, and, and so that's really taken a lot of burden off, off the sites to do this. And so this is ongoing. Um, there's been over 600 patients that have been enrolled in it. Uh, 120 of these patients come from the United States. This was the fastest enrolling trial um, ever. And I got to tell you, it was amazing how quick this study enrolled. When we were announced as a site for the study, we had to add an extra half day of clinic a month in order to get patients into the clinic who were interested in doing this trial. And one of my thoughts is that I mean, you're here on this um, discussion today, but there's a lot of people uh, in America that, that have a risk for Huntington's disease. And they, they may not choose to see a neurologist. They may be relatives of yours. They may be uh, people that you know, uh, and really the hope of a medication that would improve Huntington's really help, help people have the courage to come to clinics uh, and talk about it because it's a tough uh, disease to talk about. And so um, it was really uh, exciting to see this, this trial enrolled that quickly. Um, and we're, so the, the study is ongoing. Um, it's um, Getting the doses being given either every eight weeks or every 16 weeks now, it got changed a little bit um, as after the trial started. Um, and um, the, the main outcome will be, as I remember I showed you that graph of the motor score, the, the total motor score. Well, there's, um, there's ways that you can look at not only the motor score, but also the cognitive score, how people do on a, on a cognitive task. And also how, remember I told you about the TFC, that activities of daily living score. And so the outcome will be kind of a composite of these measures and in, into the, what they call the composite UHDRS score. And then once you finish the open label, once you finish the trial, you can go to open label and that's been exciting for patients to, to know that they're gonna get treatment. Um, there should be things coming down the pipeline. The um, companies disclose that they may wanna look at people that have later onset HD. So these are patients that you know, maybe get HD later in their life or patients that are um, not symptomatic and those are under development. So th there should be more coming um, once this gets going. So the, the key about um, Generation HD is that approach knocks down wild type and mutant Huntington. I remember I told you about that. So, so other companies have taken an approach that says, what if we just stop the, um, the mutant Huntington. And so WAVE is an example of this. And so what they've done is they've created a compound where they have um, an ASO that really only targets the, the long CAG repeat and leaves the other one alone. And the idea is that there may be some benefit to, to keeping the good one and only knocking down the long one. And so this is the kind of cartoon that, that, <clears throat> that we like to show. It's like, they're going after the long repeat and um, the, the shorter one alone. Um, and so that's, and that's the goal. And that study is ongoing and they're um, um, doing that study in North America and Europe as well. And they're trying to find the right dose to, to give to patients. And we'll look forward to seeing how that works. Um, um, the one update that I'll give you is that they used to look at two SNPs. Um, so this was a, a SNP one and SNP two. And so those um, studies are ongoing and there's hope that they actually may look at a third a SNP as well so that everyone, because um, you have to have that SNP or that little change in your DNA to be uh, considered a candidate for this medication. So that's gonna be exciting to see how they develop this one. Um, uh, we're hopeful that in, uh, there's a typo here, but hopeful in December of 20, uh, 
uh, later on to, to have um, 21 to have a, a nice readout of this trial and hopefully go to a larger study. So um, the, the, I get a lot of questions about uh, gene therapy. Um, and there's another approach that, that where you could actually potentially infect the cell and reduce um, mutant Huntington. And so um, this approach has been done by, you know, in other diseases like Parkinson's disease. Uh, and it has a potential where you could potentially, you know, have a one shot. And I want to talk to you about this one. So um, this one's done by Unicure uh, that I mentioned earlier. And so this one, what would happen is if you're a candidate for this trial, you would um, get an injection of this uh, AMT-130 virus that has specific coding in it that would infect the, the nerves in the brain. And when it infects the nerves of the brain, it basically uh, stops the, um, it changes the way the DNA transcription happens where you don't make Huntington. So the, you know, the challenges is it's, it's brain surgery, but if you're down in Florida, you probably know all about the excellent work that Florida's done with deep brain stimulation. And so that, you know, there's a lot of people that get this type of brain surgery, it's a little different. But um, uh, the, the goal would be, could you get one shot and could you turn off uh, the Huntington gene to, to change the disease progression? Uh, so that study is ongoing now. It's um, looking at for safety right now and then potentially uh, opening up to a larger cohort. Um, the, the potential advantage to a patient is that you get it once and then you're done. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about kind of other things that are on the horizon that are exciting. Uh, so one of these things that's come up a lot is this term called somatic instability. It's a big scientific word, what does it mean? It means that like, if you look at Huntington's patients over time, that repeat is unstable and seems to get longer in some people over time, which is kind of weird, right? Because you, you, you've, you've always been taught that once you have you know, your, your DNA is static and it doesn't really change, but it's possible that um, with this expanded CHG repeat, it actually gets bigger. Um, um, in the, and this doesn't happen in the whole body. It seems to happen mostly in the brain and it's not clear why it happens, but if you could figure out why this happens, then potentially if you could stop that uh, kind of somatic instability, you could have an op opportunity to help patients. And so here's some examples of different ones that people have looked at. Um, so you could potentially um, um, influence this certain gene that if you increase the expression, it reduces um, the expansion of, of that CAG repeat. You could um, modify one of these uh, proteins that improve uh, the, the likelihood of you not having an expansion, or you could even um, create a small molecule that could uh, you could take that you could you could modify this and so there's a company called Triplet Therapeutics that are doing this and they're really um, um, working hard at trying to get to a place where they're going to do a clinical trial. But this is kind of exciting because one of the questions you always ask is, you know, why does Huntington's you know only progress only present when you're 40 or 50? I you mean, know, what happens when you're 10? You know, could it be that you know as you get older, you know, there's a change in your brain that makes you more likely uh, to progress. And so this would be another way to look at this uh, progression studies in Huntington's. Um, and then the other things I wanna talk about quickly, is, which is kind of cool, which is, isn't here yet, but hopefully it'll come here one of these days, um, is, is zinc fingers. And so what a strange word, right? But apparently uh, zinc fingers can modify um, how um, uh, the transcription of, of DNA happens. Uh, and so the idea for these is that you could bind um, the mutated or the expanded Huntington's gene and block it from being transcribed and translated. And so there's different companies that, have, that are looking at this. One company here uh, uh, has developed a zinc finger that can selectively knock out um, Huntington's disease. It leaves the normal copy alone. It's been looked at in different rodents. And so a lot of these rodents have really long expansions and they're able to kind of look at how, how it works and it leads to a significant reduction in immunity Huntington protein. So it's kind of exciting, we'll see how it works. Um, the interesting thing from this paper, which, which came out kind of recently was that um, it actually had a clinical improvement, which is exciting. So when you see uh, not only a clinical reduction in immune Huntington, but also a phenotypic improvement in the rodent, that's kind of exciting. 
The other question I get a lot about from patients is CRISPR because it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like science fiction almost, the idea that you could kind of cut out or, or modify DNA. And I would say it's generally exciting. Um, there are some potential ways that this could happen in the near future. Like for instance, uh, I don't know if you've heard about the disease called a sickle cell disease, but there's some people you know using this to basically change um, the genetics of sickle cell. But in Huntington's, it, you know, this would be kind of cool. Could you like give a give someone a medication that just cuts out the bad Huntington's and, and let it lets it go? So um, I'm not going to go uh, too much into the, the, the biology. Dr. McFarland can do that. Uh, but 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 basically, the idea is that you you would use some um, techniques to to cut out like a the um, the the bat, the longer DNA. And so you would shorten it from say a 42 to a 22. And this is some examples of what they did. So um, here you've got um, mutant Huntington aggregates. Um, where here you got the CRISPR, and you were able to cut out the long uh, CAG repeat, and you can see that it translates into reduced um, mutant Huntington inclusions, and that's kind of exciting, the idea that you could do this um, in preclinical models. These aren't in humans, but this would be the idea, could you put this in humans? Um, so, so with that kind of background, I think, you know, I, I think all of us that are involved in Huntington's, whether you're a patient involved in these trials or a clinician or a coordinator, you know, I think there are some issues that really are challenging to these studies. Um, for one, you know, how do you get these into the brain? You know, the brain is really designed to kind of protect itself from the environment, and it does this through this thing called a blood-brain barrier. So how do you get treatments into the brain? Um, one of the ways you do it is you can, you know, inject it into the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, like I told you with the spinal um, tap, so to speak. Uh, the other way you could do it, as I said, you could actually burr a hole in the skull and put the virus in the brain. Um, and there may be other ways you can do it through small molecules, but but these are certainly a challenge, right? Because it's not fun to go to the doctor every two months get a, 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 an infusion. It kind of, maybe you want to go on a long vacation, how are you supposed to arrange your life, you know? Or um, maybe you're not really interested in brain surgery. So what, what does that do for you? So whenever you do these types of procedures, it does have, you know, they have a potential for side effects. The other big question we have is when, it, when, do you, when is the best time to give these medications? Should you give them early? Like, should you give them before a person has symptoms? Should you give them right when they just have symptoms? Should you give it late? And this has been a big challenge in Huntington's disease, I think. I feel like the field is generally moving to earlier. Um, um, but I think you'll, you know, you'll see a lot of discussions um, about this in, in terms of when should we treat patients. Um, so the other thing I'd say is that it's really important for you to stay um, up to date and things change all the time. And I find this website, HD Buzz, to be quite helpful. Um, it's written not for scientists, it's written for, for people that don't speak science. And, um, and I read it, even though I think I know how to speak science, I find it really helpful to understand complicated concepts explained um, uh, so that I can understand them and you can understand them. And, um, and so, so we look at that website. The other two websites I want to point out is the Huntington Study Group has a really nice website that will review clinical trials and also Enroll HD has a website. Um, there could be some new cool things with Enroll that, that, that look for in the future that you might be able to be involved in Enroll even though you don't go to a site. So there could be some nice things for that. So those are just three re references that I want to point to your attention to. And, and I think really the, the, the main thing about research is that research starts with you. It doesn't start with the doctors, it starts with the patients, the people that are dealing with Huntington's. Um, you know, if you don't tell the, the team what's important to you, then, then we can't spend our time thinking about those things. Um, and so I've always really appreciated um, the, the input from the community in Nashville and the surrounding areas to, to learn about what to do for patients. And I think getting involved, um, being a loud voice, being uh, engaged with your community is really important. Uh, and volunteer, join in Rural HD. It's easy, you just show up, you get a free clinical evaluation. Um, that's a good one to start with. Uh, you can also sign up for HD Trial Finder to learn about 
of HD in, in, a trial information if you want to do that. And just remember that we won't ever treat HD unless we do clinical trials. That's that I think everyone knows that now with with the generation of the vaccine, we could never get to where we are to have a vaccine that could hopefully get rid of coronavirus uh, unless we did clinical trials. And so I think as a community, I think all of us know that. And I think uh, we'll teach the world how to how to treat disease when we get in, involved in HD and find a cure for it. So um, this is tough, tough disease, but there's hope. And the treatments, we've, we've shown the treatments can improve work and we have exciting things on the horizon. So thanks for your time and I uh, look forward to hearing from you and getting some, um, some, uh, some feedback and questions. And thank you, Florida, Team Florida and uh, Dr. McFarland for inviting me uh, to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Clausen. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Clausen right now? I don't think I see anything on the chat. Um, I think you should be able to raise your hand by clicking that raise hand button um, at the bottom of the toolbar. I'm gonna go. I have a question for uh, Dr. Clausen actually, and uh, maybe I can just open up um, a little bit here for everybody. But um, my quick question for, for you on whether you wanna talk about this to our audience really is some of the challenges for some of these new disease modifying therapies. Um, Antisets, oligos. So I think you mentioned one was, you know, the delivery uh, having to do spinal taps is one. And um, for us, they're fairly routine. But I think the other issue that comes to mind is um, how are we going to be able to uh, um, give patients these therapies? And then um, maybe some of our our listeners might want to hear about some of the financial or other costs that might we might need to kind of work on. Yeah, so um, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. The first way is I think if this therapy works, we're going to have to change the model of care for Huntington's. Um, and we're going to have to basically ramp up the delivery systems in hospitals like in Gainesville and like hospitals around Florida and Gainesville and like Nashville and surrounding hospitals to make this uh, accessible to everybody. Um, as part of that, one of the ways we're trying to do that is to create what's called a Huntington's network. And, um, you know, you you and I work together. Um, we're, we're far away from each other, but we work together. So in Nashville, we work together with hospitals close by. So we've got uh, three hospitals in our network in Memphis, Knoxville, and Chattanooga. Um, and so with that network, we cover a lot of Tennessee and we think that we can see most patients in that network. So that's another goal. I think the issue of cost is, um, I'm not an economist, but I can say that um, you know, this was, you know, an example of recently approved medications like do tetrabenazine, we've been able to get patients who didn't have insurance, this medication in our in our center, 11% of our population is uninsured. Um, so in Tennessee, we didn't expand um, Medicare, I don't know what Florida did or didn't do. But um, because of that, there's a lot of patients that don't have, have insurance, and we don't want to let insurance be the decider of whether or not you get good care or not. So um, I think as clinicians, we're strong advocates to make sure patients can get the medicine, even if they can't afford it. And I think I expect the same thing would happen if this became available to patients. And then the last thing I'll say is there's always progress. So, you know, you can imagine all the, the work that you guys have done with delivery of DBS and how that's evolved over the last 20 years. Imagine what we can do if we know that we have to give a therapy intrathecally. And so you can imagine there'd be progress on developing new technologies or new pumps or new kind of gadgets that could deliver this medication. So I'm optimistic also that we'd find ways to give this medicine that wouldn't rely on having to do a spinal tap every time. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I, I, I do want to tell our audience that, you know, I guess we're not... Uh, um, one good thing really for us is we're, this is these antisense therapies are actually ASOs are not new. I think there's another uh, childhood disorder we call spinal muscular atrophy or SMA 
that's kind of leading the way on the forefront. So I think that will actually probably help our Huntington's community. Uh, we're already giving kids these treatments and um, I think uh, the education that's necessary and training of our new um, fellows, recruits that come into our clinic um, to be able to give these um, types of treatments will actually pave the way in some ways. And um, I'm, at least I'm hopeful because I think it's actually helping us address sort of the costs and other issues. So we got a bunch of other questions that are coming up. So I don't want to take, so I don't know if you saw these questions. Yeah, uh, Dan, I can you grab, there's a few on Spinal Taps. Uh, yeah, I, um, I don't think there's a limit to how many times a person get a spinal tap, at least not having to come across one. Um, you know, I think um, there's been a lot of technological advances with um, um, spinal taps. Like if you look at the old days, when I was, when Dr. Mafaro and I were residents, we used to use these honking needles that had these huge holes in them. Um, but now we've got these elegantly small um, needles that have delicate points and you're able to get, um, do spinal taps with, you know, without a lot of side effects. But, um, uh, so I think there's no, there's no genuine limit. Now, you know, there could be some questions about that over the last, you know, when you do the study for four or five, six years, but I don't, I don't know of any, um, the other, um, question about was about uh, expanded access or compassionate use. Um, so this is an interesting question. So um, this is, I would say this is drug company dependent. There are some companies that do expanded access and others that don't. And it has to kind of do with safety monitoring and things like that. So um, um, I think if, if there's a specific compound you want to look at, you may want to talk to Dr. McFarland and team because you know, some of our companies, we do do that. Others, we, uh, others, they don't. Um, how long till we see treatments being available? I assume that's about disease modification. I mean, I would say that, you know, optimistically in the next year, we'd have an answer on the, um, uh, on the Roche Genentech study. Um, but I, I would say the horizon is the next five to 10 years, we're going to have some very clear answers on this and maybe sooner. 